fingers crossed. Sure. Hello to everybody. I think I'll be waiting for the official start for a couple of minutes more. If you don't mind. Um, okay, just to see. Two more minutes. Sure. We have students coming from other courses, so. Oh, interesting. Very good. Good to hear that. And usually you keep you keep records of the lectures for your own library, digital library or something. For yes, other yes, we do. Oh, that's a very good idea. Very good idea. All right, so shall we make an official start? Sure, please, ready? go ahead. The professor, okay. Um, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, as you can uh, imagine, it is one of the major impacts of uh, pandemic that the world has surely become smaller these last couple of months, maybe it's not a couple of anymore, it's quite a long time somehow. Um, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to the fourth public space talk series of Eastern Mediterranean University Urban Research and Development Center. Um, for your information, this webinar um, is recorded for the future use and will be accessible on the website of uh, Urban Research and um, Development Center. For the ones who may not know, uh, EMU's uh, Urban Research and Development Center uh, aims to deliver uh, innovative responses to urban challenges by providing a forum uh, of contributions to the quality of urban environment to promote sustainable urban settlements. Um, the center has been established in 1999, committed to serving Cyprus, uh, and it follows its mission by stimulating research uh, into urban and regional uh, issues and contributing to the knowledge in the field of urban planning and urban design. Following its mission, uh, our center is organizing a COVID-19 uh, public space talk, uh, talk series to provide a virtual discussion uh, platform to share know-how um, on the future of our cities and public places. When the concepts of urban health and uh, inhabitant health resiliency 
have become more prominent due to COVID-19. We believe that we have to revisit the future of our cities and living environments. And more importantly, to have, we have to do it in a different way than before. Um, our fourth uh, public space talks is somehow corresponding with Urban October and World Cities Day as announced by UN Habitat. Urban October was launched by UN Habitat in 2014 to emphasize the world's urban challenges and engage the international community towards new urban agenda. It starts with World Habitat Day on 5th of October and ends with World Cities Day on 31st of October. This year's theme for Urban October is valuing our communities and cities. And with these uh, public space talks, we try to create awareness within our university, community and region. With this in mind, I would like to welcome Professor Ali al -Rauf, who is the head of research and development urban planning department in Doha, Qatar. Professor al -Rauf focuses on research within the domain of theory, criticism and creativity in architecture and urbanism. He was a visiting scholar at University of California at Berkeley. He published more than 150 journal refereed uh, papers, critical reviews, essays in addition to books and book chapters. He has been invited to present his research work at the international institutions in over 30 countries. Al Ralph is the recipient of a number of international teaching and research awards, including Best Research Paper in EISD Conference in 2018 and Best Book Award by ISOCARP in again 2018. Uh, Professor Al Ralph currently acts as a board member in the International Society of City Planners um, and Society of City Planners and the leader of Green Urbanism and Planning Group at Qatar Green Building Council. He will give us a lecture with the title of Say No to New Normal, Yes to Normal, The Inevitable Paradigm Shift Post-COVID-19 Architecture and Urbanism. On behalf of uh, Eastern Mediterranean University and our uh, research center, I would like to thank Professor Al Ralf uh, once more to accept our invitation and leave the screen to him for his talk. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, I think you can see all my screen now. Then you can just confirm this. Um, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Great, great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sefnam, for the great introduction. Uh, and I want to deeply thank Eastern Mediterranean University, the School of Architecture and Urban Research and Development Center for inviting me. Uh, I, I visited the school maybe eight, nine years ago, and I was uh, really impressed with the creative energy in the school and in the whole university. I had a, a wonderful time there. Um, as, as Professor Sepnim rightly said, I do a lot of writings and I do writings in uh, about architecture and urbanism in both Arabic and English, but I also uh, connect to different domains. I'm the kind of person that you would might call a sort of a multidisciplinary person in the sense that my writings would include also issues related to uh, the social dimension, the uh, political dimensions. And, and, and recently I started my own uh, uh, YouTube channel. So you are also invited to see some of my uh, video interventions in both English and Arabic. Uh, yes, the title of my talk is a bit strange because uh, as opposed to what is happening in the world around us and everybody's calling for a new normal, uh, the title is uh, say no to the new normal and say yes to normal. And I would focus on the architecture and urbanism because this is actually the domain that we love and like and write about and research about and also we do practice and consult. So basically I'm going to examine the relation between people 
pandemic and the built environment. And I want to do that via five main points. My first point is contesting the notion of the new normal. And then I will talk about the beauty of COVID-19. I know that all of you would hate me, but I will try to establish a different kind of view about that. And then I will share some observations and reflections regarding what happened throughout the last uh, uh, almost a year since the, 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 the emergence of the pandemic. And then why I'm calling for normal rather than new normal. And I'm suggesting that normal is the new normal. And then finally, uh, because of my context and because of my being here in Doha, Qatar, I want to talk a bit about the notion of why community matters, why people matters, and I will use some cases to illustrate this. So yes, uh, I want to suggest that we need to say uh, uh, no to the new normal and yes to normal. And I think there is a sort of a fallacy that we started to see a lot of uh, writings, a lot of uh, media coverage suggesting that we are entering a new paradigm or we should enter a new paradigm and our life and the way we dwell on Earth would change dramatically because of the impact of COVID-19. But I would also question, what do we mean exactly by the normal and the new normal? Because before COVID-19, we were the victims of the culture of consumption, the culture of pollution, extensive building, extensive investment, and we were not able to have an opportunity to pose and ask questions. Are we really doing the normal thing? Is this is normal or we should search for the normal? Because it seems to me that we forget the normal. We abandon the normal. And, and when it comes to the inevitability of praising COVID-19, I think also we, we saw a couple of positions here. One offering, one public offering, a kind of mainstream is that we had, uh, we are the victims of a savage pandemic and it's, it's literally froze the world life in, in days. But on the other hand, I would subscribe to a different kind of approach where I would see uh, the COVID-19 paradigm as a unique opportunity. Finally, we were able to pose and ask questions. Finally, we started to think. We started to reflect. We started to ask questions related to our way of life and do we need another logic for our life or we're doing fine. So I will share some observations and reflections, but I do believe that exceptional times need exceptional decisions. And in, 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 in if you read the human history, you would realize that particularly in time of crisis. Crisis unleashes the human power, the human creativity, the ability to do the extraordinary. And therefore, I am extremely optimistic and I feel that all our creative energy and mental power and human power would prevail and emerge to plan better future and better life for all of us. And this has actually took place before. So if we examine the history of pandemics, we will do realize that human struggle to resist and improve life was there. From the flu to the cholera to the plague to the Spanish flu, you name it. In all of these very harsh situation, or either it was a, 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 an epidemic or a pandemic, the human power was able to sort of positively respond to all of these crises and come up with a great triumph. One of which is related to how we shaped our cities. I mean, uh, you look at the change, the, the radical changes in city planning and the way we envision our cities after the, 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 the spread of diseases, particularly in, in British cities and French cities, and how they started to consider the notion of public places, public spaces, green spaces, and how those are the kind of spaces that would make a balance in the city, sort of responding to the harshness of industrialization and pollution and so on and so forth. Another interesting observation that I've noticed throughout the, 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 the previous months is related to the notion of globalization versus globalization. 
and we started to realize that it seems that the globalization is kind of fragmented and a lot of evidences suggesting that we need to return to our localities. We need to respect our own territories, our own geographies, our own traditions. And it, there's no point in sort of being surrendered to this global model anymore. Also, we noticed the implications on, on, on the, uh, uh, econo the, the economic crisis. And when I say here the implications, I know that everybody sends that in terms of the uh, uh, increased lack of uh, employment and the harsh, harsh kind of economic situations. But I'm so concerned about the, the low paid uh, uh, labor and how, although they are suffering from a very harsh economic circumstances, but they were forced to go to their work. They were forced to go to their factories, to their bakeries, to, to their stores, because people who are in the lockdown, they still need those people to serve them and to provide uh, for them whatever they need in their lockdown. So this is a sort of a, also a very kind of uh, passionate, passionate dimension about the uh, economic uh, uh, crisis. And we saw for the very first time in our uh, contemporary history, uh, particularly in the last maybe uh, four or five decades that people start again here. This picture from the USA, the most important country on Earth. People are standing in line trying to find jobs. Another interesting observation is related to our world, how we treat our world, how we treat Earth. It seems to me that we went into the process of construct and deconstruct and particularly when it comes to our environment. So is, is the environment is coming back to react? How about the evidences that we saw all over the world regarding the, 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 the decrease of carbon emissions, the decrease of pollution ratios? We saw beautiful pictures in China and other, and other countries in the world where very similar to the cartoons here that before before COVID-19, we were just building, we were just commuting, we were just moving planes and trains and cars around the world, and factories are injecting uh, carbon emissions all over. And then suddenly we give the Earth kind of break, and, and, and we saw evidences of this break where animals even started to enjoy the vacant streets of our cities and our towns. Another very important uh, notion and observation for me, again, as, a, as I was observing what is happening in the, in the uh, uh, COVID-19 paradigm, is the idea of solitude, the idea of loneliness, the idea of isolation, how we were forced to be alone, how we were forced to be isolated and divorced from all the things that we love. And, and and the idea of isolation and being divorced is, is generating the concept of fear. And this is very dangerous. And I, and I would say that we saw this concept of fear in two different levels. Level is fear from the isolation, fear from that the, for some, some people for the very first time in their life, they were forced to stay at home. And when I say home here, it's not necessarily a house. In some cases, it's just a tiny room, but they had no other options but to stay in it because of the fear of the virus. Or, which is very important to us as architects and urban designers and planners, fear from the other, fear from other people, fear from, from social interaction, because also every sign was raising a red flag for us that other people might contain you, might Trans, transmit the virus to you. So one of our fundamental urban condition, which is interacting with people and being with people, is started to be so, so fragile and, and subjected to this high level of fear. And this actually affected a lot of amazing places around the world. So iconic heritage places started to be deserted places. Nobody's interested to come anymore. Everybody's locked down. 
So the most vibrant heritage places here is the case of the Colosseum in Rome is becoming a sort of literally a deserted place. Amazing public spaces. This is the case of the Alexander Plaza in Berlin. And again, a, a public place that used to be full of life, that used to be incredibly vibrant, turns into a very vacant, deserted place with very limited number of people running away to go back to their isolation. This is the case of the Le de France area in Paris. And again, the whole notion of deserted public spaces and how in, in, in literally number of weeks we started to see all of this as a sort of uh, the, the reality in front of our eyes. That was also extended to the most holy and religious places. This is the case of the of the Kaaba from uh, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And again, because of the fear and because of the impact of COVID-19, even the most sacred places resorted to the idea of evacuation and, 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 and being again a deserted place. Another interesting observation is related to the replacement of, of interaction because people are literally social animals and we need to communicate. So we replaced, we quickly started to emphasize more on the notion of social media and we kept on using those kind of what I called it the safe bubbles, because when we are in our bubbles, we can communicate, we can interact, but we are still we are under the impression that we are kind of protected. But this is not the kind of life that we want, because this life is pushing us towards losing a lot of the values that we cherish and we, we enjoy. And, and this is what distinguish us as human that we think and we build relations and we build friendships and so on and so forth. And a lot of, uh, of uh, digital, digital uh, in, uh, uh, inventors are trying to provide solutions. This is one of the very interesting solutions that I saw uh, recently where uh, some re uh, researchers are working on a mechanism where instead of having a relation via Zoom or via uh, Webex or what have you, via a kind of, uh, 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 of screens, you replace this with an actual presence, digital of course, of the person that you like or you love, your wife, your girlfriend or what have you, and then you can have a sort of a more kind of uh, 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 a replacement of the intimate relation or the intimate conversation that you usually do. But this is again, this is not a replacement. This is these are only steps to make the, the, the drama that we are living in a bit uh, softer. I think also we started to realize that we need to rework our priorities and roles and who actually is contributing in our societies. And I love, I love this image. This is the image of the medical team leaving Wuhan city in China after they were able to do a magnificent job to control the, the, the virus. And the irony here is that the medical team is celebrated by the army and the, 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 the police personnel, which is in itself an indication or at, at least an invitation for us to reconsider who is important, who is really valuable in our society, how much we invest in armies and police and, 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 and buying weapons versus how much we invest in education and research and health and well-being of the communities. I started also to consider the notion of just cities and do we have equal opportunities? I love this image, uh, this picture from again, a very fancy Chinese lady covering her uh, nose with a medical uh, uh, mask, but also she's taking very good care of her dog and she's also covering him with, uh, with a, 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 a lovely mask. But this is cannot, uh, uh, this kind of wonderful opportunity cannot happen with everyone. And we have to face reality. So the, the pictures to the right hand side talking about social distancing, we some countries and some cities can afford to do that in their public spaces, in their transportation, near their green spaces and parks. But some other cities, as you can see in the left hand side, they cannot afford to do that. They have to go out. I was conducting an interview, some interviews and I've heard people saying, if 
I stopped going out for two or three days. My family would starve to death. This is reality. So these are the kind of dimensions also that we should consider because sometimes we hear people saying, well, we have to stay at home. We have to maintain the lockdown, but we need to understand that there are thousands and millions of people. They have nothing but the only option of going out on a daily basis to work and to be able to put bread on the table of their families. So while some images would suggest for us that people adhere to the notion of the lockdown and therefore cities are totally deserted and empty via other cities where, where literally the streets are packed with people because they cannot afford the lockdown. But when you look also at those three deserted places in Wuhan, in Italy, in Philippine, we need also to consider that those images are only suggesting an aspect of the city. But in another back alleys, there are people that wake up in uh, four o'clock in the morning to go to the, uh, uh, the shops, to go to the grocery stores, to go to the bakeries, to provide all the food that these people that deserted the city will order by their phones. So again, we need to see the irony of people complaining about being at home, ordering food and watching Netflix and other group or other sector of our society who are forced to go out because they are serving uh, us, literally serving us. And this is again would lead us to the idea of the just city and how in some situations we see in a sort of uh, sad proximity, the disparity between people that can afford, people that can be isolated, people that within their gated communities can enjoy the tennis courts and the pools, while other people in a very crowded situations, they have to go out and they have to work. And in some cases, when the World Health Organization were doing their statistics, they realized also that the COVID-19 is spreading uh, in, in, in a very high rates in these kind of contexts because they lack service and they have to interact and they cannot afford the isolation, the, the lockdown. This is happening all over the world that in, in, in a lot of situations you see in a very, very dramatic manner, the disparity between people who are privileged and people who are suffering. Even when you play golf in, in, in your golf course, you don't, you don't realize that there's another community just in the back of this green screen that was initiated to prevent the golf players from seeing reality. And you know what? When it comes again to the notion of new normal versus normal, all of this was discussed before. We have outstanding literature, social justice in the city, seeking spatial justice, the just city. We have incredible amount of literature all of which were published decades ago, alerting us to this. So we don't need a new normal to alerting us that, to the idea of we have to seek for spatial justice. So in other words, I would invite to a new paradigm and at the same time, I'm saying there's a fallacy for calling this new paradigm a new normal. And my intervention here is based on the notion of the community. And I think the community is the new key word, and I will elaborate on that. And I will elaborate on that by suggesting that it seems to me from what happened throughout the last eight, nine months, that we saw a sort of a fallacy of the individualism. The individualism is not going to serve us. It's not going to serve us as a society, as a, as a, as a community, as uh, architects, planners, uh, urban designers, people who are concerned about the relation between people and places. And I see more evidence to the notion of the triumph of solidarity, the triumph of being together, the triumph of planning our cities together, building our architectural icons together. And again, this is not a new normal. This is the work, this is what, uh, uh, what Jane Jacobs asked for in 1961 when she was talking about the concept of cities of for all. And she was saying that a city is the, 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 the sort of the invention that has the capability 
to provide something for everybody. And why this is happening? Because it was created for everybody. This is 1961, decades ago, and we know about that. We know about the meaning of a citizen. This is the beautiful, the beautiful book, uh, A History of Walking. The word citizen has to do with cities. And the ideal city is organized about citizenship, about participation in public life. So we, we know about that, but we abandon this. We forget this. And this is why I, I, my hypothesis is based on the notion of we don't need new normal. We only forget about the normal. Let me uh, relate this to our main domain, uh, architecture and urbanism and, 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 and city planning. And, and my first intervention would be, I think we should move from planning cities to building communities. And here I would stress the idea and the significance of learning from this crisis that planning cities is not about the physicality of the city. We fall for a good number of decades, particularly in the last 20, 30 years, in the notion of the image of the city, the spectacle of the city. And we forget totally about engaging people, listening to people. And it seems to me that all of us, we need to reread the, the beautiful book, The Fountainhead, and we need to go beyond the ivory tower and go down from the ivory tower. We need to learn how to actually engage with the public and meet community needs and listen to the people and stop designing and planning by assumptions. We do that a lot, that we know the truth. We know how people would live. We know how people would experience places. But I think the beauty of COVID-19 is it's telling us, well, wait a minute here. People are using spaces in a radically different manner. People are giving uh, new priorities for their relation with places and spaces. Another interesting thing is related to what I called it, the architecture and urbanity of power and consumption. In, in, in our crisis, in our current crisis, and particularly in the very first months of the blockade, we did realize that huge shopping malls, great mosques, the center, the business centers, the huge hotels, all of these places are becoming empty, are becoming deserted are becoming abandoned, although we invested again a lot of money because the people started to inform us about the actual needs, the new realities, and how to emphasize on their rights for other quality of spaces, like green spaces and public spaces, rather than all of the iconic architecture and urbanism that we were more excited about. Although we still subscribe to this model, these are some examples from the context where I live and belong to the Gulf. For these are skyscrapers from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from Bahrain, from Kuwait, and all of these places were literally deserted. And everyone was looking for a tiny garden to, 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 to go to it or a, a vibrant neighborhood to walk in it. So this would lead me to another notion that I want to share with you today, which is the idea of the size and the scale of the city. I think also for a good number of years, we were so excited about the global model, the Saskia Sassen model of the global city. And I think we need to move from this metropolitan mega cities to more a more town-like kind of environment, a more urban village kind of environment. And I think this is highly needed that we have to uh, contest the size and contest the idea of the least is the most and less is more. And we did realize during the crisis that the notion of the urban village and the compacted urbanism is becoming really beautiful one. People are so excited about coming after months trapped in their homes to go and have a walk in the neighborhood to go to, the, the, to the, the corner shop and grab some bread and milk. All of this is uh, sort of inviting us to revisit the concept by which we arrange our cities and we arrange our places. And again, this is not new normal. 
This is what a lot of researchers, intellectuals, practitioners talked about for a long time. Look at the concept of the compact cities. This is a decade long concept, but we were not able to see how we can invest in it, how we can transform it into a global reality, how we can transform it into a concept that we can use it all over the place. This is some diagrams from the beautiful book by Richard Rogers, Cities for a Small Planet. This book was published at least uh, uh, three decades ago, and he was saying basically that the failure of our urbanism, the failure of our cities is related to this separation, that we divided cities into zones and we keep on commuting between all of these zones. And he was suggesting that we need to do a bit of overlap in this compacted urbanity. And I would add to this that here, particularly when it comes to us professors and for students, graduate and undergraduate students, we need to revisit the way we interpret architecture and urban planning in a way that we will give more value to urban design. And I'm so happy that the center that Professor Septnam and her team uh, 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 initiated at the university called actually urban research and development because it seems to me that urban design is the right tool and the right domain and the right discourse to bridge the gap between focusing on architecture as an independent uh, icons and planning as a sort of a way to zoom out and have a bird's eye view uh, that usually ended up with a master plan. I think COVID-19 told us that it's not enough to have iconic architecture and a master plan for a city. We need to have beautiful streets. We need to have interesting way of commuting. We need to have uh, vibrant public spaces. We need to have houses that uh, would accommodate you for weeks and months and you will feel good about yourself. So all of these principles are not new. They are extremely old, close to city center, close to public transport, close to walkable, walkable streets, the notion of walkability, the notion of the proximity of activities, how to bring work and leisure and, and, and dwelling together in a very uh, proximate uh, way, close to parks. If you have a, a, a water body on the edge of the city or the town or penetrating it, how you use it? how you make public spaces and, and waterfronts as a public space. And what I like about Thriving Place Index, for instance, is that we started to learn from uh, 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 our mistakes and we started to learn from the shortcomings that highlighted during uh, the, the COVID-19 paradigm. And we started to insert very interesting new notions, the notion of health, the notion of community, the notion of equality, the notion of social justice, the notion of social mobility, the notion of employment inequality, the notion of community participation. All of these, it seems to me, are not again new normal. They were there. All of us were aware of it. But I think it's it, again, I am praising COVID-19 for inviting us to bring all these tools and activate it again and again. With that said, I would move to the notion of housing because also during COVID-19, we started to see or to establish a radically new relation between us and where we live. And again, as I said earlier, is it a form of an independent house or a townhouse or a condo, apartment, a room, what have you? But we did realize in a lot of situations that the majority of the, the, the world population, they live in inhumane conditions. They cannot uh, afford to stay in these places for days and weeks and months. And we started to, to see a lot of people suffering, literally suffering from the isolation, including psychological problems. But again, is this new normal? No. This is one of the most famous pictures, which we called it in, in, in theories, the death of modern architecture. When we started to literally demolish the buildings that 
dealt with people as numbers. Those kind of concrete, concrete jungles that were created without any human aspects. But ironically, we're still doing that. This is a housing project that were just open in Egypt, I think uh, uh, two or three months ago. And I wrote a, a, a big critical essay about it where I described it as uh, human storage units rather than houses for people, right? And the, uh, the, more, the more ironic uh, uh, interpretation of that in the same context, when you move only a few miles and you realize that the graveyard has more humanistic dimension than the ugly housing project. This is a place where you have intimate scale, where you have a tapestry of open spaces, semi-open spaces, closed spaces. You have a bit of greenery, you have a bit of colors, you have a bit of sense of walkability, all of this in a graveyard. So look at the degree that we, we arrived at, that housing projects are not for human and places for dead are more human, by, and, and, and by far, I would prefer to stay here rather than stay here. And then we started also to see a wonderful patterns, wonderful patterns from human behavior, because how architecture helped them to, to do that. So I love this picture because it, it, it's, it's an invitation to reconsider the notion of the balcony. COVID-19 provided for us a wonderful, wonderful example that the balcony is not just a place to look uh, from it towards where did you park your car, but it's a place where people would exhibit their creativity. It's a place where people will exhibit their solidarity. Look at the beauty of the gentleman here playing his guitar and his neighbor is listening to the tunes. And, and this is again a wonderful way to overcome the, the psychological impact of the isolation. So this also suggesting that the relation between house and nature is revisited in the lockdown era. We started to realize that it's not only about having sophisticated houses with I don't know how many inches TVs, but it's about how those houses are related to nature and are related to nature via number of spatial qualities, balconies, gardens, roofs, internal courtyards, how our houses are uh, allowing natural lighting and ventilation. Before COVID-19, we were bragging that we never opened windows. We rely on air condition. We love air condition. We love artif uh, artificial lighting. But now we started to realize that even a tiny balcony would, me would mean a lot. And I, I literally mean that by a tiny balcony. I, each one of us in his or her home, he can create in small niche, not necessarily a lavish garden, not necessarily an American kind of backyard or front yard, but we have to use our capabilities to create sanctuaries, to create places, places that would heal, literally would heal people and would inject energy in them. I noticed uh, some excellent examples in a lot of places around the Middle East related to the notion of the roof and how the roof, which is literally a marginalized speciality, how COVID-19 invited people to rediscover it and reshape it. Uh, some people during the month of Ramadan cleaned, look at that, look how, how roofs used to be. And they cleaned it and they transform it into a places where they can have breakfast, they can pray, they can have some social gatherings, or some people provided more sophisticated solutions, like how to transform those roofs into literally roof gardens, into place for families, into place where people will get together during the, 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 the lockdown or even after the lockdown to socialize and eat together and talk together and, and, and experience a different kind of quality of life resulted from revisiting a space that used to be only for water tanks and satellite dishes. Another important point, particularly for us as, uh, as uh, uh, architects, and this is, this is one of the 
kind of typical uh, typical plan and some images for one of the houses in the Gulf area. And you can you see the the, the quality of spaces and you see uh, the 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 areas designated for uh, receiving guests, uh, 12 seats kind of dining room and so on and so forth. But one of the beautiful, beautiful outcomes of COVID-19 is that I've noticed in my interviews and my research that a lot of people started to say, well, I'm not, I'm not enjoying my house. 50 or 60 or sometimes 70 percent of the percent, uh, 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 the area, the percentage of the total area of my house are designated for others, are designated for, for guests. No. Now it's the time to look again at the way we design our houses, how every single part of the house is needed to play a role designated for the family rather for than guests or people that want to brag in front of them or exhibit pride that we have luxury houses or whatever. Family members now, they need place to work. We started to have homeschooling as a new pattern of teaching and learning. We started to see that people are doing some internal sports and some kind of new social spaces are needed to accommodate, accommodate all of this. Those are the two spatial qualities that we need in our houses. We don't want anymore to spend incredible amount of money and spaces in having a luxury dining room that would be only used once a month. And when you move from the scale of the house to the scale of the neighborhood, again, it's very interesting that we started to realize the value of local life, the sense of belonging, the sense of community, the value of locality, because we started to go out of our houses. We started to walk around. I personally started to walk out of my house and I started to get to know some of my neighbors that I've never known that they do exist. We walk around and we started to talk and we started to chat and we started to exchange ideas. Before that, our normal quote unquote was just jump in your car and go somewhere else. And this is why I think COVID-19 is inviting us to value what we used to do before, the idea of sense of belonging to our bigger family, which is our adjacent community. And this is also related to the notion of public life and public spaces. Yes, social distancing is important, and we have to be very strict when it comes to that. But I think good cities that were able to overcome some of the bad consequences of COVID-19 are the cities that are equipped with diversity of public spaces, diversity of green spaces that would make people see and to be, we love to see and to be seen. We love to socialize, but also if those public spaces can accommodate us and at the same time maintain social distancing, this is the ultimate goal. One more interesting observation that I want to share with all of you is related to the rhythm of the city. We started to see a bit the rhythm of our cities is becoming slower and slower. We are not using our cars anymore. We are walking. We are using our bicycles. And this is absolutely wonderful because this new rhythm is suggesting a lot of human interactions, is suggesting a lot of human encounters, a lot of human confrontations that would be extremely, extremely impossible if we 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 still using our cars and we still relying on the speedy kind of uh, of mode of transportation and urban mobility. Another interesting phenomena is related to what I call the, the culture of consumption. We started to realize that we need to be wise about using physical and natural resources. A lot of us, including myself, we revisited our belongings. We did realize that all of these suits and shirts and watches and shoes and whatever you have, you don't use it. You don't have to buy all of this. 
How many of us opened their cupboards and they discovered that they have things inside that they were not even aware that they bought it and they never used it? I see Professor Serpnam raising her hand. Me too, right? So it seems to me that one of the beautiful, beautiful lessons for all of us, and, and, and this has a lot of impact on the way we design spaces and places, is resisting the culture of consumption is looking at how we will make people happy without shopping carts and without shopping bags. But this is kind of tough because as you can see in my image here, they started even to have shops called COVID-19 essentials. So I know it's a huge challenge, but we will try to stop that. And, and, and I want to go back again to the notion of participation and collaboration and co-creation in urban planning, architecture and urbanism. Because as I said in the beginning of my lecture, I'm so excited in, about the notion of community and how to bring people again to the whole idea of producing architecture and urbanism. Particularly because also COVID-19 gave a lot of local communities what I call it rising critical abilities. People started in a lot of cities around the world to say, wait a minute, our government are not doing a good job. Our resources are not invested in the right channels and we need to pause and ask questions regarding that. So it seems to me when it comes to human community participation that I would reject this model big time. I want to reject the model where we look at citizens only as a recipient of the final product. We do a lot of workshops after we are done with our architectural schemes or urban schemes or city planning schemes, and then we will invite people to look at what we have done. This is not community participation. This is not user participation. This is a sort of we are just checking the box that we engage the community. I am more excited about a sort of a hierarchy where we start the whole narrative with people, conducting discussions and conversations to be informed by the community. What exactly do you want? What exactly do you need? What exactly they are aspiring for? And we go all the way in the process of consultation and, 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 and involvement to reach the ultimate goal, which is the community is actually our partner. So community is not only a group of people where we will present our work uh, in front of them, but actually there are our partners and the partnership here would start from the way we articulate projects and needs. And the same story would go to the educational process in architecture and urbanism. I would say we need to reorient the compass of education towards real project, towards focusing on the needs and aspirations of society. We need to, to prepare architects and planners more to be part of enlightening people and, in, and contributing in the, in the overall knowledge paradigm. Let me move quickly to some cases uh, from Doha, Qatar. And uh, I'm not sure that all of you are familiar uh, of Qatar, but Qatar is uh, near UAE where you have uh, Dubai and, and, and Abu Dhabi uh, with uh, some uh, 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 southern borders with Saudi Arabia. And uh, as a typical Gulf uh, state, Gulf city, it was subjected to a dramatic growth in a very limited time frame. This is Doha, the capital of Qatar in 1937. And this is Doha now. And you can see that the center of the city is this tiny part that you can see in my map now. So all of this, all of this sprawl, uh, urban sprawl took place in the last 60, 70 years and partially uh, or actually mainly because of the uh, outstanding oil revenues. The number of projects that I would share with you now is related to the idea of what would happen if architects and urban designers listen to the community, is this would add positive layers to your project? This is one of our iconic projects in Qatar. We called it the education city, where you have a great number of universities, including Texas A&M, Virginia Commonwealth, Georgetown, and so on and so forth. 
but we started when we started to listen to people, they alerted us that Education City is becoming kind of gated community. It's only for students and researchers, and it's not going to really manifest the identity of knowledge based urban development. It's not melting with the boundaries of the city. So we did a lot of workshops and in those workshops, when we started to listen to the local community, they said, let's insert the activities that would bring the community in, in, in Education City. And we started to do that. And the planners and the architects and the, 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 the coordination team responsible for the project, they started to insert projects like public parks, like mosques, like small designated gardens, like even a golf course, like a different kind of sports activities, like a public library. And all of these resulted from the interaction with the community so we have a, a, a very interesting ultra modern mosque that's becoming one of the very important social centers and where people go for praying activities and so on and so forth. And also the National Library. This is designed by M. Coolhurst. And the whole idea of inserting the library within the fabric of Education City is again to bring people to it. And M. Coolhurst in the different workshops was convinced to transform the library into an agora, into a public space. So when you enter the library, you are not under the impression that this is a disciplined place for a book, but rather that it's a social place. It's a gathering place. And it's becoming a very iconic, iconic uh, uh, center within the fabric of Education City. Another example related to the value of listening to people. This is the project of the urban vitalization, revitalization of the old center of Doha. And the typical answer would be a set of skyscrapers similar to what to, took place in the other edge of the bay. But again, with the enlightened leaders and with the intervention of the communities, we started to look at the project as a sort of a, 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 a modern contemporary creative reinvention of the value of the past. So in this sense, you don't want to recreate the past. You don't want to copy the past, but you want to learn from the different principles, the deep understanding of the past and how this would help you to create a more human friendly environment. So suddenly within the Gulf, we started to get rid of cars. We started to have more human oriented spaces, more modern language, but at the same time very connected with the past and articulating a new kind of a spatial experience within the heart of the city. Another interesting example also from Doha is the, the related to the narrative of the Museum of Islamic Art that was designed by I.M. Pei. Amazing museum, an amazing piece of architecture. But we started also to ask people question regarding how to emphasize the relation between the city and the museum, how to make the museum part of their daily life, as opposed to it's a deserted place isolated for the sophisticated cultural elite. And the answer came from why don't we relate the museum to a public space, to a public park? And suddenly, we started to create a very interesting dialogue between a surrounding public space and a green space that is kind of creating a positive dialogue with the museum. So we, we, we started to see the museum not as an independent entity within the fabric of the city, but a sort of a new public space would be created with a lot of activities that would speak to the museum. And you end up with a lot of people coming to the to the to, to enjoy the park, particularly this family. When I was doing my book chapter about this museum, I did interview this specific family and they told me a wonderful story. The father told me once the, the park was open, we would come here on a weekly basis to have picnic and enjoy our time and the kids play and ride their bikes and so on and so forth. And one day my kid told me, what is this big building over there? And I told him, I have no idea. 
let's go and ask. And we went and they told us this is a museum of Islamic art and it's for free. You can go in and they went inside the different halls and different galleries. And he told me that since then visiting the museum is becoming is becoming kind of routine to their weekly uh, trip to enjoy the park. So in this sense, the museum going to the museum is becoming a byproduct from going to the park and enjoy the public space. Another interesting notion related to the idea of the street, how streets are envisioned, how streets are used. And, and this is one of the important uh, streets in, in, in Doha penetrating the, the business center into the left hand side. This is one of the biggest shopping mall. I would say it's a very ugly street. It's not safe to be in it. There's no walkability in it. There's no way of enjoying it. But if you have car dependent culture, no one would agree about that we need to do something about this. But when we started to have again communications and workshops with the community and we showed them examples like the case of Maria Helfer Strasse in, in Vienna, the beauty of giving the priority for people who are walking or riding their bikes and how the street is connected to public transportation, we started to have a momentum to move the Qatari cities from car oriented to people oriented context. And I think this is again in itself something that we have to celebrate and we have to appreciate that regular people and community members, they can really help us and enlighten us and give us a lot of ideas. And I would say also we need to learn from the multicultural ethics and boundaries and choices. We did realize in the COVID-19 that humans are equal. There is no rich and poor when it comes to COVID-19. There is no, even the president of America was infect, infected. So we need to celebrate diversity and we need to celebrate the unique tapestry of people. With that said, although it might uh, uh, seem that the most or the major threat that we are facing now is COVID-19, I tend to disagree and I, I use this wonderful cartoon to alert you to that climate change is our fundamental problem. And why I'm saying that? Because if you see how people react to COVID-19, how everybody's concerned, and you compare this to our behavior on a governmental or institutional level or even individual level when it comes to climate change, you would realize that we need to change our perception. We need to change our actions and we're not losing anything. Look again at this beautiful, beautiful cartoon. We, we're looking for sustainability. We're looking for green abilities. We're looking for livable cities. And this gentleman is saying, what if it's a big hawks and we uh, create a better world for nothing. It would be never for nothing. It's for us. We will enjoy it. We cannot blame ourselves for creating a better world. With that said, I would say people are beautiful. People are not beautiful as they look, as they walk or as they wear. And this is what COVID-19 showed us explicitly. People are beautiful as they love as they care and as they share. And also hope is beautiful. And I think we don't need a new normal. We need to be human, just and normal. And thank you so much, uh, Eastern Mediterranean University and Professor Sipman for having me. Thank you very much. Professor Al Rao, I think it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was great to have you. Um, when you were talking, uh, I I made a small note in in quotations. I said people, and it was interesting that you have just finished your presentation by saying or by indicating people. Absolutely. are the most, most, most important value that we have. And I believe um, 
I know a lot of our students are or have been listening to your presentation. Um, for um, for our students, it is uh, important for the future, actually for the future architects or urban designers or planners, it is important to understand that in the core of planning and design and architecture, there is people. Um, OK, we have to be creative. Uh, architecture is also related with aesthetical issues, form, function, this and that. But we should never ever forget people. We are designing or we are planning for people. So um, this is this your message was very important uh, in that sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is a, a question, so if, if you don't mind, I, I, I will read the questions if there Absolutely. are any. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, one of our students says, Noor, uh, I agree with you in all of your points, especially in the injustice of the social organization in almost every field and how the unfortunate that have no voice are the ones most affected and how COVID is shedding in the light of on those urban and social problems that have always been there but never addressed. I think the cause of this is the drive of economic gain and materialism that came after the industrialization period. I hope after this pandemic we can create a normal that's beneficial for all. That is a comment more than a question, if you want to say something. Can't, can't agree with you more, Noor. I think you did articulate my ideas even better than what I did. Excellent, excellent comment. Ab she's absolutely right. Thank you, Noor. Yeah. I don't know if we have any other questions. I'm just checking. Um, I think what you have mentioned as um, remembering what we already have or had before uh, or, or what we have forgotten. And now that we need to, yes, rediscover, reshape, redesign, reunite, revisit everything um, that have, that we had left in the past, maybe. Uh, maybe our young uh, future colleagues are not aware of this uh, because they have been uh, grown up in a very fast society, you know, fast of everything and very technological, very much digital, maybe uh, even human uh, interaction uh, was not as, um, as dense as before in, in our old times. But now it is time to remember these, and I think as professionals or professors, it is our duty to um, to make you know uh, our students, our colleagues, our young generation to remember, to make them understand these uh, and revisit the past in a way. Uh, this would be my comment. You know, Professor, I mean, you are absolutely right. And uh, uh, particularly what you said about the new generation is, is, is extremely crucial and significant. And I've noticed something very interesting when they started to open up some uh, restaurants and coffee places in, in Doha, Qatar, and also in, in, in Washington, D.C. I was in, in, in America a couple of weeks ago that the new generation who are sort of glued to their smartphones and, and iPads and whatever, they started to abandon it after COVID-19 and they started to initiate discussions and face-to-face -face kind of interactions. And I think this is absolutely uh, uh, support your point that even the young generation, they started to have a new taste because before they were so surrendered to the second life that I am physically in a place, but I am virtually in another place. Yeah. I think even the young generation now, they are so much enjoying looking in the eyes of other people, talking with them, eating with them, having coffee with them. So again, I think all of this due to the beauty of COVID-19, as I say. Yeah. Uh, another comment, I don't know if you 
are able to read it? You want to? No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Professor. OK, uh, while the urbanization in 21st century, our city is facing many changes and challenges, but in Middle Eastern cities, we only focus on big cities such as Istanbul. How do we make urbanization in small cities? Or I should add to it, do we need to make urbanization to our, in our small cities? Yeah, exactly. You, you answered the question beautifully, <laughs> Professor. Yeah, this is exactly the point. Why, why we all, particularly in the Middle East and in, in, in Turkey, in Istanbul, in, in, in Dubai, in, in Qatar, Doha, uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, all of these places, they subscribe to the model of the big, the highest, the more. And, and as you rightly said, it's about too much urbanization. We need to control all of this. We need to realize that finally less is more, not from Mies van der perspective, but from a social and urban perspective. Exactly, exactly. A couple of more comments or questions. Um, I got confused about the normal and the new normal. The comment is the normal that we are living is ill normal. Scholars when pointing out these ills and urban problems are seeking to shift the paradigm and get to a new normal. So we need a new normal out of the normal that we got used to. COVID only intensified these problems. You highlighted your observations, but what is the solution? How to reach a better future? <laughs> well, I think uh, I think all the second half of my lecture was about solutions. I provided solution on the level of housing and architecture, on the level of urbanism, on the level of city planning. But but let me go back to the notion of normal and new normal. My problem with the term new normal that is suggesting something uh, uh, ambiguous something new, something we need to think about, something we have to wait for it, something that we are now in the middle of the crisis, but hopefully in the coming months and years, we will be able to face the new reality. My thesis in this lecture was based on the idea that what we used to call normal was not normal. The idea of consumption, the idea, as you rightly said, too much urbanization, the idea of individualism, the idea of focusing on iconic building and iconic architecture without addressing the real needs of the society. And yet we also realized in this lecture that we have a lot of red flags in our modern history. We have a lot of wonderful literature. We have turning, uh, turning points and paradigm shifts and great books, but we were not using it. We are not activating it. So I think COVID-19 is suggesting that we really need to activate all of this, not to look for the magic word called new normal. But of course, maybe for the new generation, we may call it new normal because they were living in a normal from their uh, own generation. Uh, but for maybe for our generation, uh, we are going back to old normal, which is not new for us, but <laughs> which is new for the new generation. So maybe our um, audience is is uh, confused because of that. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I, I, I totally agree with you about the generation gap. This is something yeah. that we have to acknowledge. But at the same time as the example that I've, I, I talked about regarding that that even the young generation, they started to have a new taste yeah. and also the young generation, they have memories, they have narratives, they have stories from their parents and from grandparents, stories from places when people go to a specific historical places in Istanbul or Famagusta. This is opening up for them uh, historical yeah. evidences that there was another rhythm of life. There was another quality of life. And we should, I'm not saying again and again, we should not copy it. We should not repeat it. But my idea is instead of investing energy and time and money 
in envisioning a new normal, I think we should look at what we have and to celebrate it and reinvent it. Yeah. Um, one more comment. Community engagement might work, might work on urban and architecture production, but usually such such schemes work within the sociopolitical existing framework. No profound changes. This is why we are still looking for new paradigm shift. The small, tiny solutions are not working. Uh, well, yes, I totally agree. And, and, and this is why I'm saying, uh, and that was part of my lecture, the idea of how COVID-19 provided the communities with critical power. Because before COVID-19, a lot of governments, particularly in the Middle East, we were dealing with us as kids. Listen to us. The government is doing that. The government knows what to do. Now it seems to me that the community is sort of empowered. The community realized that we have a say and that our priorities in some cases is ra are radically different than the priorities that are generated from the political agenda. So I totally agree with the, with the, with the comment, but at the same time, I am extremely optimistic that what happened in the last nine months is suggesting also a new paradigm for the way we perceive our roles as uh, as local communities. Exactly. And the final question that we have, uh, Jakubu, our student, how can we advocate better collaboration between the architects and urban designers and planners in order to ensure a quality of urban life, considering that most architects are only bothered about making high rise iconic buildings with huge messes. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is this is a beautiful, beautiful question, but I would say uh, Yaqub, his name is Yaqub. Yaqub, yeah. yeah. I would say, Yakubo, if you are a student in the School of Architecture at the uh, Eastern Mediterranean University, you you can find the answer because I think the, the effort of Professor Sepnem and her team is exactly in this, how to bridge the gaps, how to make architecture and urban design and planning not independent domains anymore. They have to overlap, they have to interact, and this is why in some studios that I would run, I would make the, the, the design problem sophisticated in a way that it would tackle the three levels, the level of architecture, the level of urban design, and the level of planning. So I think the solution should start from the school time, where as an architect or urban designer or planner, you would realize from your first day in the school that all of these domains interact and overlap as opposed to other schools where they invest in the separation and invest in the isolation between the three domains. So Yaqub, you are you are absolutely lucky being with Professor Sepnam and her team. <laughs> Thank you so much. I said last, but we have two more and I will take them as last. <laughs> sure, um, sure. And there is an anonymous question. Don't you think that people's new behavior and the government seeking to reach new solutions that respond to the new conditions is temporary? We will soon go back to the normal. We lived last and last years. Well, this is again a wonderful, wonderful comment and wonderful question. And I think I think what we need to do, not only on architectural and urban uh, and urban level, but also as community leaders, intellectuals, writers, artists, media people, we have to raise a new wave of awareness that we don't want to go back to consumption. We don't want to go back to individualism. We need really to see what emerged in the in the COVID-19 era as values that we should celebrate and cherish and adopt. Yeah. And um, Kasra, another question. How about the night? Can't we use this extra source of time and space more in urban spaces, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, yeah. You, you see, it, it's a Kasra. Her name is Kasra. Yep. Yeah. You know, Kasra. Amazingly, 
you see in a lot of cities now around the world, including Washington DC, the capital of the United States, that in the night time, people started to claim streets and public spaces. Restaurants and coffee shops will put more tables right in the middle of the streets and they would force uh, uh, car drivers to divert to other routes. And suddenly, very, very sort of uh, uh, car-oriented streets are transformed into beautiful public and gathering spaces. So I totally agree with her that it's not only about a specific time frame or a specific number of hours in the day. The night time is absolutely a, a sort of uh, uh, interesting platforms, particularly for social activities and gatherings and so on and so forth. And thank you, Professor. Someone says for the wonderful presentation that could be our last. My question will be is these solutions will only be effective in this pandemic period or for the future of urban design as well? Well, to, to be honest with you, my intention from this lecture is to invite you all to consider these solutions as sort of, I wouldn't even call it solutions. I'm saying those are only number of gateways that I was trying to open up today. And each one of them needs more elaboration, needs more research, need more creative interventions. But my hope is that we will not get all these solutions as temporary only for the coming couple of months and then we'll go back to what we do. Big mega structures and iconic places and streets packed with cars and lack of public spaces, lack of greenery and lack of social interactions and solidarity and so on and so forth. So I hope that we will take all of these solutions as a sort of this is the norm. This is what we want to do. This is how we want to live. Yes, hopefully we will be learning from the bad times and, you know, COVID-19. It has been a catastrophe to our lives, to the cities, to families. We had a lot of people who died sure. very unfortunately, uh, but life is going on and we need to learn from the bad, from the negatives and try to turn these to positives for our future. And I should say that um, as future uh, professionals in architecture, planning, urban design, uh, you, our uh, students, friends, have a big responsibility. Um, and you should uh, be aware of this and learn from these bad days for your, not only for your profession, but for the future of the communities and for the future of the society. Because as uh, Professor al Rauf has mentioned, uh, people and human beings are in the core of uh, design and planning and architecture. So I would like to uh, thank you, Professor, once more for this wonderful, wonderful um, presentation. Thank you. It and, was my honor. It was my honor. Thank you. Uh, and we would like to see you again, maybe in the future. Sure. One of the one of the positives of this pandemic period is that world has become smaller. Now we can organize events uh, like this. We can invite each other to our courses, etc. So this is somehow a rich. This has become a richness from another. Uh, optimistic perspective. Um, so uh, I would like to thank all uh, attendees who have participated and who have been with us. Um, and I would like to wish you all a good evening or a, a good day wherever you are. Thank you so much, Professor. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you.